So when we're talking about kidney stones, we need to consider how they're formed. And so you might recognize this structure here as a nephron, and we've got many of these in the kidney. Their main function is to take blood, so I'll write blood here, and filter it. So I'll draw the afferent arterial right here, and you can notice the efferent arterial giving blood back, and there's your glomerulus. So the nephron will filter our blood, and what we'll get out of it is urine. And as you know, urine is just a solution. And a solution is just a combination of a solute and a solvent. Now in the case of the kidney, the solvent is mainly going to be water. So it's water that's going to be taken up from the blood and filtered through to be part of the urine, so just water. And the solute can be a variety of things, and we'll talk more about that in detail. And you might recognize potential solutes as calcium oxalate, urate, sodium cysteine, anything that will come together to form a stone. But in order to form a stone, the first thing we have to do is undergo crystallization. So let's start here and talk about the steps to crystallization. Now this usually occurs in a spectrum, so I'll draw it like that. Then we'll start up here where our crystal is least likely to form, and let's say for example the crystal has some calcium and some oxalate in it, so we're trying to form a calcium oxalate crystal. Well at this early stage when we don't have enough of the calcium or the oxalate in our solution, they're less likely to form a crystal. So what you'll predominantly have here is what's called dissolution. So dissolution of your calcium oxalate crystal. So I'll draw this very erased out because it's unlikely that this will form a crystal. And we have a name for this place or this zone on our spectrum and it's called the undersaturation zone. The undersaturation zone. Because we're undersaturated in the things that we need to make a crystal. So calcium and oxalate will just pass on through the urine and be peed away. Now let's say we start to get more saturated with calcium and oxalate and we get to this threshold right here that's marked by a number called the solubility product. The solubility product. And sometimes this is written in equations as Ksp. And all this tells us is what the concentration of the calcium oxalate compound is relative to the concentration of calcium in the solution and the concentration of oxalate in the solution. So if we have a lot of this calcium oxalate trying to form, we'll get into this next zone that's called the metastable zone. This is the metastable zone because we're not quite undersaturated and we're not yet oversaturated. We're in the middle, so we're meta, which means that rather than the dissolution of our calcium oxalate crystal being more likely, here our calcium oxalate crystal has the potential to form. So what we have is the potential for calcium oxalate crystal formation. And because it's more likely for calcium oxalate to be formed here, I'll still draw it a little erased out, but less than above. And the reason why we say we have the potential for crystal formation is because there are other things that can be present in our solution to help the crystals form. So these things that help crystal formation are called promoters. And these are separate solutes that may be present in our solution to increase the likelihood for crystal formation. So for example, let's say in our proximal convoluted tubule here, so part of our nephron very early on, we have calcium that wants to be reabsorbed and put back into our bloodstream. And we also have sodium present here. Now the interesting thing about these two guys is that they're absorbed at times by the same protein channel. And what can happen is that the sodium can outcompete the calcium to be reabsorbed outside of the proximal convoluted tubule into the bloodstream. So if it's reabsorbed, that would leave more calcium present in the tubule to eventually form a crystal. And as you might imagine, this is something that can happen in folks that have a high salt diet. So that's one way we can promote crystal formation. Another way would be if we have an individual that has a lot of sodium urate, so sodium urate, I'll abbreviate like this, in their urine. And what sodium urate tends to do is that it likes to aggregate like this. Let's say it aggregates and just kind of clusters together. And when it clusters, it'll create these bonds that hold it together. And what can happen because of these compounds forming in the urine and taking up space, the calcium and the oxalate that's there in our example don't have space to hang out in here. They don't have as much space to flow in the urine. So they may be pushed together and that in turn can cause an effect that's referred to as 
salting out, which just means that the calcium and the oxalate are forced to come together and form a crystal. And one thing that's important to note is that urate is an example of a purine, and a purine is something that's found in meat. And so you might end up having this occur if you have a high meat diet. Okay, then finally, perhaps the most important example of what can help promote crystal formation is if you have an obstruction, like I've drawn here. Let's say urine wants to flow this way, but it's not able to because it's blocked off. That means that if we have a large amount of calcium and oxalate, they're more likely to interact with each other. Therefore, it's more likely for crystal formation. Okay, so we've talked about a couple of examples that will promote crystal formation. What about things that will inhibit crystal formation? So inhibitors, or things that will decrease crystal formation. One example of an inhibitor is citrate. Citrate is an ion that will grab onto things like calcium and prevent it from interacting with other things in a solution, which are things like oxalate, which means that less interaction here translates to less crystal formation. And you may recognize citrate as a compound found in these citrusy drinks. So I'll write citrusy drinks, which can include things like lemonade or orange juice. Now a condition that can serve as an inhibitor is if you were to drink a lot of water. So let's say this is your renal tubule here and you've got some calcium and you've got some oxalate present. And say they're present in concentrations that could be considered the metastable zone and they could interact. But because you're drinking so much water, there's going to be a sort of rinsing effect here. So I'll write rinsing down here. And this occurs because you can achieve high urine flow, especially if you drink around three to four liters, which is the amount of about two full soda bottles of water, which will then translate to less crystal formation and down the line, less stones. But let's say despite our best efforts, we pass this threshold here that's marked by a number that's known as the formation product. The formation product, and this is similar to the solubility product above, but this marks a threshold beyond which formation of these calcium oxalate crystals are likely. And some refer to this zone, if we're going to go with the same type of terminology as above, this zone as the unstable zone. The unstable zone. And so at this point, our calcium oxalate crystal will finally form. And so let's scroll down and focus on this little guy right here. This is referred to as a nucleus, or the process of its formation is also known as nucleation. From here, the next step would be crystal growth, which means this little ditzel over here would become a lot bigger. And remember, all of this is happening while it's passing through the renal tubules. From there, what can happen is several of these crystals can aggregate. So I'll show you three of them here that are formed and larger. They've grown. And now they're aggregating. They're interacting together. They're forming this type of complex. So we have crystal aggregation. And at this point, this complex has grown big enough that it'll cause some irritation or inflammation to our kidney. So let me draw our kidney right here. So here's our left kidney. I'll draw it like that. And to orient us, let's draw the artery there, maybe the renal vein going that way. And then here we'll have our renal pelvis that becomes the ureter. So there's the ureter down here. This is the renal pelvis. And I'll just connect them here. So this complex that's up here now is going to cause some irritation in the renal papilla where it sits. So irritation or as we refer to it commonly in medicine as inflammation. So inflammation can occur in our renal papilla here. And again, this occurs because we formed what's referred to as a plaque. And this plaque will continue to grow until it falls. It'll fall away from where it was adhered or stuck onto the renal papilla, so it'll fall. And it'll land down here, maybe in the ureter. So I'll draw the complex like this. And I think you can see that now we're blocking the flow of urine. So if urine's trying to flow this way, unfortunately, it's not gonna be able to pass when this complex is sitting here. And it's at this point we finally formed a clinically apparent stone. And this is the guy that's going to cause us some severe pain in our back and commonly results in a visit to the emergency room. And so in preventing a kidney stone, there are many steps along the way that we've recognized. 
And these are also opportunities to intervene before we get down to this point that we're in severe pain. And remember, overall, the most important solution to crystal pollution down here is dilution.